Hi, my name is Brooke Norton, and I would like to welcome our internet audience to today's talk. Uh, I would like to begin by reading our land acknowledgement statement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Berkeley, California is on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenye Ohlone. We respect the land and the people who have stewarded it throughout many generations, and we honor their elders and their ancestors. We are living in a moment that warrants deep reflection on our past and present. As a museum dedicated to advancing knowledge of the archaeology and history of the ancient Levant, the Body Museum welcomes scholarly discussions across boundaries of nationality, religion, and gender identity. In many global contexts, equal access to health care, education, fair wages, and human rights is contested on the basis of sex, gender, and other identity categories. In an effort to bring to light these timely issues, to serve a broader public audience online, and to connect to the local community that it serves, the museum is taking action to becoming a more inclusive, welcoming, and equitable institution that practices the philosophy of radical inclusion adopted by its parent institution, Pacific School of Religion. One of these steps is the continued creation of public programming. Through this lecture series, we hope to highlight new and established scholars who are engaging with risky and marginalized topics concerning women, gender performance, and sexuality in the past. We invite you to participate in these programs so that together we can listen, learn, and work towards creating a more inclusive museum community. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to now introduce my colleague, curator, Melissa, Dr. Melissa Craddock. Thank you, Brooke. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Jessica Nitschka is a research fellow in the Department of Ancient Studies at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She's also the editor of Ancient Near East Today, a digital platform for public scholarship published by the American Society of Overseas Research. Dr. Nitschka received her PhD in Ancient History and Mediterranean Archaeology from the University of California, Berkeley. Her research concerns the history and archaeology of the Eastern Mediterranean in the first millennium BCE. She's carried out archaeological fieldwork such, such as Tel Dorm in Israel and Tel Tamai in Egypt, and she's involved in the curation and study of Egyptian antiquities in South African collections. She co-edited the volume titled Postcolonialism, Heritage and the Built Environment, New Approaches to Architecture in Archaeology, which was published by Springer in 2020. Currently, she's working on a monograph on the Alexander Sarcophagus from Sidon. And it, uh, the floor is yours, Jessica, for your talk entitled Dress and Representation of Women in Phoenician Visual Culture. Take it away. Okay. Great. Okay, can you see my screen? We're good? Yes, we are good. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Melissa, for the introduction. So the, there we go, oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, the topic of dress in antiquity has become rather popular in the last two to three decades through a profusion of conference sessions and edited volumes. These discussions and analyses have, have benefited from multidisciplinary approaches, showing that even though we are unable to speak to ancient people to fully unlock the code of ancient dress habits, it is still possible to apply contemporary dress theory in order to better understand the function and meaning of dress in ancient societies. The books on the screen cover a wide geographic and chronological range, However, noticeably absent from these works is any discussion of dress in the Phoenician world. Why is that? Well, perhaps it's, in, it's part because of the problems of the evidence. Uh, but before we get to that, perhaps we should first clarify exactly what we mean by dress. Uh, for this, I follow the definition offered by anthropologists Mary Ellen Roach Higgins and Joanne Eicher, whose work on the anthropology of dress since the 1960s has made a big impact on the field. They essentially define dress as a series of body modifications, including but not limited to clothing, jewelry, hairstyles, skin modifications, and so on. Roach, Higgins, and Eicher prefer the term dress over other terms found in the discourse because it is both unambiguous and relatively free from bias. They also put the body at the center of discussion of dress, which I think is an important aspect to keep in mind when we consider Phoenician depictions of dress and social identity. So what evidence do we have for studying dress in the ancient record, and in particular, the ancient record of the Phoenician world? 
And there are basically three potential sources of information. The first is surviving physical evidence related to dress. This would include actual garments worn if we had them. Uh, for the Phoenician world, we do not. So in terms of surviving evidence of dress that was actually worn, we are limited to jewelry, metal attachments, and other accessories. Physical evidence also includes materials relating to production or manufacture of clothing, such as spindle whorls, loom weights, dye facilities, and so on. Uh, the, the manufacture of textiles is an area that we are seeing more research attention in archaeology, which is great. Uh, the second category is uh, testimony in ancient texts. To my knowledge, we have little to no testimony concerning dress in Phoenician and Punic inscriptions, but I have to admit I have not combed this corpus looking for such evidence, so if anyone knows of anything, I would be keen to hear about it. Uh, there's an occasional mention in uh, of Phoenician dress in uh, clothing, etc., in classical or biblical literature, but these are of limited use for understanding actual Phoenician dress practices or Phoenician social attitudes towards dress. And the third and most important category is artistic or iconographic representations of dress. Most of our evidence for the forms of dress in antiquity and their function and meaning in ancient societies comes from the visual record. This is true not just for the Phoenicians, but for all ancient peoples. We do have quite a lot of visual depictions of dress in Phoenician and Punic material culture and a wide range of visual media, even if it is not as perhaps rich as some other iconographic traditions. The question is, of course, how do we go about analyzing this corpus with regard to the social practice and meaning of dress? What do these representations of dress signal to both the viewer and the patron? So again, to pull from the anthropological literature, uh, dress functions as a form of nonverbal communication made up of signs, the meaning of which are culturally determined. Dress presents a wide range of messages and meanings to a wide range of viewers and wearers. Dress can signal various social categories that make up identity. Uh, on the screen, I put a general list of categories and messaging. Uh, the ones with an asterisk are ones that I think are somewhat ambiguous in the Phoenician visual record, whether that is intentionally so or simply because we lack the necessary access to the code. This is up for a debate. Uh, for, of course, dress is a closed code. Uh, items of dress do not possess inherent meaning. Rather, that meaning is assigned and specific to certain social and cultural contexts. How do we unlock the code from artistic, artistic depictions? This is the challenge because artistic representations of dress do not constitute documentary information. Artistic depictions are constructed images that have their own purpose and are governed by certain rules and limitations. Uh, we are missing a lot of information, of course, that is key to analyzing dress. Sound, smell, movement. Our artistic depictions are fragmented and incomplete. One, special, uh, one especially obvious problem is the disappearance of color. To study dress in black and white, this is a real challenge. So my approach is not to try to reconstruct what Phoenicians actually wore, but rather to ask what are the representations of dress in the visual record trying to communicate? Are Phoenician social identities clearly indicated through dress in either minor or mon monumental art? Are women's identities represented in minor or monumental art? If so, what are those social identities? And can we figure any of this out from the visual record based on the limited information available to us? I want to explore the questions posed above by looking at some specific examples, especially of women, since women and gender are the theme of this series. I am focusing on stone sculpture from the Levant, as that is what I'm most familiar with. I want to point out that I am not a specialist in women or gender in the ancient world, nor am I a specialist in dress. Uh, this is very much a work in progress, and I look forward to feedback and ideas in the, in the discussion. Now, although women are frequently depicted uh, in, or represented in small scale terracotta sculpture at Phoenician sites, we cannot unfortunately uh, say the same for stone sculpture. So, for example, in the 500 or so fragments of votive sculpture from the Temple of Amrit, we cannot confidently point to any pieces that seem to depict a female figure. Even at the Temple of Ashmoon at Boston Ashik, uh, Rolf Stuckey has cataloged about 250 figural sculptures or fragments of figural sculpture from the sanctuary. Although there are some notable uh, examples of sculpture of female figures, perhaps goddesses, that date to the Roman period, there are very few uh, prior to the Roman period that seem like they might represent female persons. 
Uh, then we have the anthropoid sarcophagi from the Persian period. Uh, this consists of 120 or so anthropoid shaped coffins and mostly marble. The majority are from Sidon, but examples pop up at other sites in the Levant and in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, these objects present an interesting case. The patrons of these coffins, particularly those in the Levant, for the most part, chose not to represent much in the way of dress at all. Uh, what we have is mostly just hairstyle and head coverings. And as shown by Becky Martin in the previous lecture in the series, which I highly recommend, uh, these hairstyles do not always clearly signal male or female. And given that the anthropoid sarcophagi allude to the body, uh, some more than others, as you can see on the right, but reject uh, many forms or most forms of dress, I think that any serious study of the significance of dress for social identity in Phoenician art needs to take a very close look at this corpus. However, that is not what we're going to do today. Uh, instead, we are going to look at the material from Umal Ahmed. Uh, the reason for this is that this site offers an interesting corpus of individuals and dress, both male and female, which serve as a good case study to address some of the questions I raised earlier. So just to give some background information, the site of Umal Ahmed is located near the town of Nakura, about uh, 20 kilometers south of Tyre, maybe four kilometers near the south of border of Lebanon, and I'm sorry that I cut off uh, the, the name of the site uh, in the slide. But um, at any rate, uh, the site has been investigated by various French orientalists and archaeologists, uh, first in the late 19th century and then into the 20th centuries. Uh, scientific uh, excavations of the two temple precincts were carried out in the 1940s. Uh, it was a small town dominated by two temples. And the site is perhaps best known for its Phoenician inscriptions, approximately 16. Uh, these inscriptions suggest that the primary occupation and building activity occurred in the third and second centuries BCE. There are no major rem remains from the Roman period. The site has produced a varied collection of figural sculpture. Today, this corpus is mostly split between the Louvre and the National Museum of Beirut. Now, there's a tendency in ancient Mediterranean studies to categorize both clothing and art stylistically based on its perceived ethnic or national origins. Any archeologist with basic art historical or iconographic training in the ancient world might look at these images and immediately categorize the two on the left as Egyptian dress, uh, the third image as Greek dress, and the one on the far right as Persian dress or Persian influenced. This tendency to focus on dress as an ethnic marker has, I think, held us back in the analysis of dress and representation in Phoenician art, as there is a tendency in the field to begin by separating everything into categories of Assyrianizing or Egyptianizing or Persianizing or Hellenizing. I think such categorization is of limited use in understanding Phoenician social perceptions of both dress and art. Therefore, I am going to try to avoid such labels as much as possible. So what I wanna focus on today are the relief stelae. These are the most common sculptural type at Umal Ahmed and present us with a number of examples of both male and female figures. Uh, over 20 stelae are recorded as having been found in or around Umal Ahmed. About 13 have been identified as male individuals, six as women and three as a male female couple. They are carved out of a local stone uh, they all suffer from extensive weathering due to the coastal location. Many are in a fragmentary state. Uh, no signs of paint remain as far as I know, but I assume that they were painted in some form or another. I should also mention that none were found in situ or even come from the controlled excavations. They were found either through clandestine means or found in secondary contexts. The form and composition is more or less the same in all, as far as we can tell. They are rectangular in shape, upright with a semicircular top. Often a winged sun disc fills out uh, the top of the stele. This is of course a common symbol in Phoenician art. Uh, an individual or two individuals stand in profile with the right arm raised, palm facing outward. Uh, more often than not, the individuals are facing right, but sometimes they face left, as we shall see. And in the case of the couples, the two individuals face each other with their palms facing one another. Uh, exactly what uh, such a gesture means with the, with the right hand raised, uh, what that means in this context is open to some debate. Uh, the gesture is of course not exclusive to Phoenicians. It is found in the figural representation of both mortal and divine figures in a wide geographic area over a long period of time. 
And the stele with similar iconography as these have been found individually in other locations, uh, other Phoenician sites in the Levant, but the Umalamid collection is the single biggest uh, collection. Finally, I should note that the size is not the same, even within the Umalamid corpus. Uh, I've, I've indicated the preserved height in all the cases uh, where I know it. Uh, before looking at the dress in detail, we should ask, uh, what is the function? Well, the lack of clear context has left the function open to some debate. Most people describe the stelae as funerary, primarily on the basis of the inscriptions. Six of the stelae have inscriptions preserved. They are highly formulaic. Uh, there are essentially two variations, which I have put on the screen. Uh, either it's, you know, for the person named, so for Baliaton, uh, or it says, you know, this is the commemorative stele of uh, the person named. As the inscriptions don't directly mention a god, scholars have interpreted these, these inscriptions and thus the stelae as funerary. Whether or not this is the correct interpretation, like I said, is open to debate, uh, as is the question of whether we can extend that interpretation to the stelae that lack inscriptions. There are six stelae from Uma Ahmed that depict a, women, a woman by herself. I only have images of the five that are currently in the Louvre and the National Museum of Beirut, which I put on the screen. Uh, as you can see, they are not all complete, but from, from what remains, we can see they all have roughly the same composition. Uh, an individual stands in profile with hand raised, palm facing out. Note that the broken one in the upper right-hand corner is facing left rather than right. Even so, it is still her right arm that is raised. Uh, for the figures that face right, uh, they each stand with their left leg forward and right leg slightly bent to the back. The weight is shifted toward the front leg. On the image uh, on the left, you can see that the figure is standing on a base, which itself is decorated with two female figures with long hair kneeling on either side of a three-stemmed plant, pouring a liquid, presumably water, at its base. If these are funerary stelae, then perhaps this scene makes reference to rebirth or renewal in the afterlife. Let's take a closer look at the more complete ones, specifically the representation of dress. Uh, they are presented in similar, but not exactly the same dress. Uh, they are, each one appears to wear a long pleated tunic. It reaches all the way to the ground. Uh, and the two where the bottom of the stele is preserved, we can see the feet peeking out from beneath the folds of the tunic. Um, let's see if I can get the pointer working. Yeah, so here, here, um, and then here and here. Uh, the, uh, the figures do not appear to be barefoot, but no footwear is clearly articulated or preserved, ex except perhaps the one on the right. Uh, maybe she is wearing some sort of sandal, uh, perhaps paint was used to indicate the footwear. All three figures wear an overgarment or mantle that falls to a slightly different length in each of the stele. So on the one on the left, it falls to about the knees. On uh, the center one, uh, it's not 100% clear, but maybe mid calf. Um, and on the right, uh, also uh, mid calf. In all three stele, stele, the mantle is closely wrapped around the body, so much so that it forms almost a sling for the raised arm, which is clearly outlined by deep carving, as we can see here, and especially here. The garments hug the body, as we uh, can see the clear curvature of the back, waist, and hips. And the tightness of the mantle is achieved by the left hand, which uh, tightly holds onto the edge of the mantle as it falls in curves that are softly rendered in the stele, uh, the left hand stele and the right hand one, and then uh, more sharply indicated in the center uh, example here. On the uh, example on the right, the head seems to be uncovered and the hair tied up with some sort of ribbon that flows out the back. In this stele also, the artist has taken care to really emphasize the curvature of the body, especially the hip and leg through, uh, through the fabric here. So, what messages uh, or identities are potentially being communicated by the dress choices and the representation of the dress? Gender seems to be the most obvious, uh, perhaps also of course, devotion or piety, uh, some sort of sacred setting. It has been suggested that these women may represent priestesses, more on that later. Um, the economic or social status within the, the community. There's a lot of fabric here, uh, an emphasis on fabric. 
The quality of the fabric is perhaps communicated by the effort put into representing the drapery. This to me suggests wealth. Um, then perhaps also then there's, a, there's messages about beauty, um, marital status. To dig into this a bit further, we uh, really need to compare the female dress with uh, the male dress. So on the left here, we have two stilai uh, for two different individuals named Baliatan. Uh, the one on the left is Baliatan, son of Baliatan, the chief. Uh, the one in the center is Baliatan, son of Abdor, uh, priest Kahen of Melkishtart. So how does the dress of the men compare to that of the women? Uh, starting at the top, the men wear a truncated cylindrical hat. This is sometimes referred to as a, a kedaris in the scholarship on the assumption that it has been borrowed from Persian practice and iconography. There is a tendency in the literature to associate it with royal or priestly status. The men are clean shaven. Uh, this is the case for all the stelae of male figures at Umal Amen. As for the clothing, the male figures also appear to wear a long pleated tunic as a primary garment. Over it is either a mantle that is belted in such a way as to create pseudo sleeves, or it is a robe with sleeves that are sewn, uh, sewn into the garments. Either way, both garments are ankle length in contrast to the women's tunic going all the way to the ground. This allows us to clearly see that the men are barefoot. Uh, both the men and women have, however, the same gesture of the right hand. But while the women grasp the mantle with the left hand, the men hold an object uh, they both hold the same object, and uh, more on that in a moment. There's a clear difference in the relationship between the fabric and the body and how the fabric is depicted in the male images. While there is an emphasis on drapery throughout the women's garment, uh, in the men's, this is restricted to the sleeves, which are represented ha as having you know, some, some depth and movements, I think. For both men and women, the right arm is raised uh, in, the in, in, in that gesture. Uh, that arm is heavily cloaked in fabric, but it is clear that the men have more freedom of movement in their garment as compared to the women. The lower half of the men's tunic and mantle, by contrast, appears stiff and straight. Uh, the mantle or robe is especially noticeably straight and smooth compared to the women's mantle. I wonder if this is meant perhaps to indicate a different type of fabric. Uh, some have suggested that the stiffness in the representation of the men's dress is the result of a less talented sculptor's hands. However, the details, especially in the uh, steely on the left, I think, uh, argue against the suggestion. We can see uh, subtle and skilled working of the stone in not, uh, in not just the sleeves here, but also uh, in the modeling of the face. So I prefer to see the stiffness of the garment as a stylistic choice. Uh, regarding profession, the dress of the male figures has been characterized by scholars generally as priestly attire. Uh, what do the inscriptions tell us? Well, uh, as mentioned, Baliatan in the left is, is labeled as a rob or a chief, but chief of what is not indicated. Uh, Baliatan in the center is labeled as a kehan or a priest. Uh, there's nothing about the dress uh, of these two individuals which conveys a difference in rank or status. So from this, we might hypothesize that dress in the art of Umal Ahmed is not used to indicate status as a priest, or at least a particular type of priest. But I, you know, I say that with a big, you know, asterisk of caution. Um, now, as mentioned, the male figures in these stelae hold an object in their left hand. In the original publication, this was described as a sphinx. But as clarified uh, by the work of Henrika Michalau, the object is actually a type of ceremonial spoon, whereby the handle is in the form of a naked girl all stretched out, who, and she holds a spoon part in her arms. These are sometimes referred to as swimming girl spoons because of the pose of the female figure. And while the types uh, from Egypt, and that's where this uh, type originates from, is Egypt, uh, the types from Egypt typically present the girl with a wig, uh, the examples in our reliefs here to, uh, present the figure as wearing a royal headdress, uh, hence the original reading that these were sphinxes. The main point here, though, is that the individual male figures carry a ritual or ceremonial object, uh, the same object in this case, despite their different titles, while the female figures do not. Uh, another uh, distinction between the male and female representations of dress at uh, Umal Ahmed is that there is more variation in the dress uh, among the men than there is among the women. So uh, 
The one on the left is the one we just looked at. Uh, in the center, we have we can see that in this figure, the the rover mantle only covers uh, the upper arms. It goes only so far as his elbows. He has a stole of some sort over his left shoulder, um, right here. It goes down to about here. You can see the tassel. Uh, he also wears a flatter uh, fabric hat resembling a beret or the perhaps a Macedonian calcia. Uh, he carries a small box instead of a ceremonial spoon. He is called the chief of gates in the inscription. Uh, perhaps then in this case, then what we do see here is a distinction in dress due to official role or occupation. On the right hand uh, side, we have a, st a stele that is dedicated on behalf of Abda Don, uh, according to the inscription. Unfortunately, only the lower half is preserved, but we can see that the tunic falls only to mid-calf rather than to his ankles. Uh, the figure is barefoot, uh, as is the center, central one I forgot to mention. Um, the depiction of the garment's relationship with the body in this right-hand example, the way it hugs the body, showing off the curvature of the hip and the leg, this reminds us of the representation of the dress of the female figures in the previous slides. Now, there is a comparable stele in the collection of the American University of Beirut. Uh, in this case, the stele is more or less complete, but it lacks an inscription. Uh, we see a similar garment, uh, this one um, also reaching mid-calf. And we can again see the clear curvature of the back, hips, and legs. Uh, the cloak or mantle is drawn very tightly, uh, again creating almost a sling for the arm, similar to the depictions of female dress that we saw earlier. I assume it is for these reasons that the curators of the AUB Museum labeled this image as female. Yet in our comparable stele from Uma Ahmed, the inscription clearly indicates the figure is male. Um, because I've now added the rest of the inscription, it says Abdadan, son of Abdrabat. So does this mean we should read the AUB stele as male also? Or can this type of dress and representation with, you know, with the body, the way it interacts with the body, can this be used by both men and women? These images would seem to invert or at least challenge our expectations of what constitutes male versus female dress. Now, I didn't comment on the head covering of the figure on the left. It is difficult to make out, but I do not think in this case that it is um, that the figure is veiled. I think rather we are meant to understand a skull cap of some sort. Now we have another sculpture from Umal Ahmed that also highlights uh, this ambiguity. This is an orthostat found in the courtyard of the Temple of Melkashtar by the excavators. Um, a single figure is represented in relief with a hand raised in the now familiar gesture. The figure stands before a votive or sacred column topped by an Iolic capital. The excavators in their public final publication identified this figure as a male priest. Uh, when I looked at it, I thought surely the figure is veiled and it's female, but uh, now having looked at the other images that I just showed in the previous slide, I'm not so sure. Uh, part of it really depends on whether or not we think the head is veiled or wearing a skull cap. And, you know, as often happens, the kind of critical point is, is damage. Um, but uh, even if it is a veil, could the figure still be male? I mean, after all, in Roman arts, it is common for depictions of men to have their outer garment drawn up over their head. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that question aside for now. We should also consider the stele of the male and female couples together. Uh, these two uh, uh, on the screen are the best preserved, I am sorry to say. Uh, but uh, even so, in, in both examples, we can see that the couple face each other. The male figure is significantly taller than the female figure, but less so in the example on the right. They both raise their right arm with palm turned outwards. They also both hold an object in the left hand. Uh, the object in the man's hand is schematized and abbreviated. Um, and here I'm just really looking at the, um, the left hand example. It's because it's clearer. Um, but uh, like I said, it's, sorry, it's schematized and abbreviated, but it is, I think it is meant to represent one of the ceremonial spoons with anthropomorphic handle that we just looked at. As for the woman, it's difficult to see, but there is certainly an object in her left hand, and it is a narrow jar for perfume uh, or oil. As for the dress of these figures, it is largely the same as what we have seen on the previous stelae. However, in this stele on the left, the uh, man's head covering rises higher in the back than in the previous examples. 
And as for the woman, the mantle of the woman looks a bit more like a robe with actual sleeves. Uh, there may even be three garments. Uh, it's hard to tell. I mean, you can see, because you can see what looks like uh, an edge or hemline here, but a garment clearly goes across here. So perhaps this is another outer garment. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, due to the style and the preservation, it's, it's difficult to determine. So uh, what to make of these uh, stelae of uh, the couples? There are no inscriptions on the stelae of the couples, uh, at least none survives, uh, that can provide us with context or interpretational hints. Should we assume they are married and that this perhaps accounts for the presence of an object in the woman's hand? Uh, does the cosmetic vessel re reflect the ceremonial act of getting married? Uh, do the hand gestures, the right hand raised, also depict the act of giving vows in a marriage ceremony? Uh, are these steely, steely then commemorating the, the marriage or are they funerary? Do they mark a joint grave? If we assume that the couple is married uh, and that the steely is funerary, do we then hypothesize that the steely of individuals indicates unmarried status uh, at the time of death? Um, might this then account for the more voluptuous, uh, perhaps even sexualized representations of the bodies? Uh, these are a lot of questions, uh, which I'm afraid I don't have answers to, but before, um, but I ho hope you'll, uh, you, you will indulge me to uh, return to one issue and raise some more questions uh, before, before I wrap up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there has been some speculation if uh, perhaps the women represented here hold some sort of priestess status, uh, and perhaps this is what actually merits their representation in stone, their, their proximity to deities or priestly elite. You know, perhaps, but it's notable that one inscription we have, that of Isi Bark up on the upper right hand corner, uh, makes no mention of a title of priestess. Uh, there is also nothing in the dress that signals clearly priestess, at least not to us. Uh, but uh, looking at these stelae, uh, stelae did make me rethink a couple of other stelae from elsewhere on the Phoenician coast. And these two stelae follow the general type that we have seen so far, a, um, a round top stele surmounted by a winged sun disc. Uh, in the left example, the sun disc, has, it looks like it's been chopped out. Uh, we have an individual figure in profile with the right hand raised in the gesture we are very familiar to, uh, with by now. Uh, the dresser is clearer. The dress is clearer in the right-hand example. Uh, she wears a wide-sleeved robe that is bound up under the breasts, clearly indicating the gender is feminine. Uh, in her left hand, she holds a papyriform staff. On her head, she wears a rather interesting headdress. Uh, it seems to be a variation on the iconographically well-known Nemi's headcloth uh, from Egypt, and. Um, I also just want to say, before I forget, while I'm zoomed in, uh, I want to point out that you can see here clearly the preserved paint uh, on her hand. Uh, there's also a little bit on, on the hair, maybe also uh, on, on the, the staff, and also up on the rest of the headdress. Um, and let's go back to these, yes. So as for what is on top of the, you know, the pseudo Nami's headdress, uh, or wig, whatever you want to call it. Uh, on the right-hand side, we can clearly see a pair of cow horns and a sun disc. Here are the cow horns, here's the disc. On the left, it is less clear. Uh, maybe these are meant to be ram's horns at the bottom. Uh, maybe these, these here are feathers, like in the Atef crown, I, perhaps, but they're a little uneven. Uh, it does seem to be a sun disc in, in the middle. Now, uh, as I've indicated here, the Louvre catalog labels the Sili on the left uh, as a goddess. Um, and as far as I uh, have uh, been able to determine, there is no label for the one uh, from the American University of Beirut, but if there is one uh, and someone knows about it, please let me know. Uh, as for the identification of this figure as a goddess, I can certainly uh, understand why. The relief depiction from the famous Yehelmelk stele dated to the fifth century BCE looms very large in our field. And uh, the principal goddess of Byblos is here depicted. Uh, she is adorned with uh, cow's horns, uh, a sun disc, and a wig that perhaps resembles that uh, on our stele. 
uh, and she holds a papyriform staff in her left hand. Uh, in the Yehelmic stele, stele uh, the distinction between mortal and divine is, is clear. But I wonder if in Phoenician art, the distinction between divine and mortal is always so stark. Uh, and if there is not more blurring between the iconographies, especially in funerary art. Uh, for example, on the Anthropoid sarcophagi, we see multiple use of symbols that we might otherwise associate specifically with royalty or the divine. Uh, they are drawing on Egyptian iconography, which itself regularly blurred the line between divine and royal. So we have from left to right uh, an image uh, of, a, of a person with a false beard. Uh, in the center, we have someone holding the was scepter. Uh, and on the right, we have both a Nemi style uh, headdress uh, plus a false beard. In the case of our stelae with divine attributes here in the center, we might ask if this is not meant to be a funerary stele of a mortal woman, either in the guise of a goddess or simply dressed as a priestess. After all, we don't actually know what priestesses wore uh, in, uh, in the Phoenician Levant. Uh, the obvious comparison we can make here is the famous sarcophagus from Carthage, which shows uh, a, a woman in relief wrapped in goddess-like wings. <clears throat> but if we do insist that uh, this depiction in the center uh, is that of a goddess, and thus presumably part of a religious uh, uh, relief uh, or votive relief of some sort, what does this mean then for our other female uh, stelae from Umal Ahmed? Can we be so sure then that they are funerary and not votive? Well, to wrap this up, I have uh, raised a lot of questions and offered very few answers. As I said at the start, this is a work in progress and clearly there is a lot of work to be done uh, on the interconnection of dress, representation, art, identity, and gender in Phoenician studies. Uh, so thank you for your attention and thanks especially to Helen Dixon for retrieving some last minute uh, data for me on the collection at the American University of Beirut. I look forward to the comments and feedback. Thank you so much for such a stimulating talk that, as you say, raises a lot of questions. And on that note, I would like to invite anyone who's tuning in live, uh, our YouTube audience, to submit any questions or comments or responses that you might have um, in the chat box, and then we can present that during the Q&A to our speaker. So um, I'll go ahead and kick this off. Um, so it, it's pretty clear from the, I'd say one, one of the things that is quite clear from your talk um, and the corpus that you presented from Umal Ahmed is that they're quite heavily weathered, they're pockmarked, they're fragmentary. Could you discuss some of the challenges that you've had with interpreting uh, the extant evidence of dress and other characteristics of these stelae on the one hand, but on the other hand, in light of the loss of important data about these objects due to the material of the stone and how the particular material has weathered in the in this coastal environment. So for example, details of the sculpture as well as this presumed loss of paint. Yeah, sure. Let me just go back to kind of throw some of them back up on the screen. So I mean, I think more so than the preservation, the biggest problem is really just the, the posse in number. Um, I mean, it's nice that we have this collection from Umar Ahmed, but since we don't have, we don't have a lot of examples of women in, in sculpture before this, it's, it's, it's quite hard to do any kind of comparison, right? Or to understand the in and, and, and the larger context. I think that's actually the biggest challenge. And the preservation here is problematic, but um, you know, we can actually see a lot. Uh, obviously, it'd be nicer if we could see more details. You know, for example, I didn't talk that much about this one, but here it's, it's a real shame because this one is different, I think, from the others. Uh, even in her arm, it's, it's, it's pulled back further. I assume that the hand is in a similar gesture, but we can't actually tell for sure. Um, so we don't actually know what's going on for sure with her hand. Maybe it's different. Maybe she's actually clutching at uh her clothing here i'm not sure also the hair and the headdress is, is really damaged so th this is this is uh, uh unfortunate it's tantalizing but um you know we we, we don't we, we lose a lot of information and there's, so there seems to be 
you know, some variation, but we can't really detect. As for uh, the issue of paint, I mean, like I said, I think surely these were painted. We saw in the one I showed you uh, some evidence of paint. Uh, how much of a difference would that make? And it, it was certainly, I don't know, it, it could make a lot of difference. We don't really know. Um, certainly there's paint reserved on other relief sculpture um, from Levant. So we see some paint on the Anthroport sarcophagi, but of course they're not representing garments so much, not the ones in the Levant at least. Uh, there is one uh, in Cyprus uh, that shows a garment and um paint uh but uh, that's uh is a whole that's a whole different uh discussion and talk perhaps um we do see on the relief sarcophagus from Sidon the morning women sarcophagus uh those women there's paint preserved uh on, on that dress so I would assume that there's paint of a similar type uh, on these also but without it it's hard to speculate kind of what we're missing but we're definitely missing something I'm not sure that there's a lot of missing details that would be in the paint uh, I assume that these feely stele were always meant to be put outdoors so I don't think they would be putting a lot of uh, detail on paint I assume the paint would be used to highlight what is carved um, but it would still you know signify something I'm not sure that's really a satisfactory answer but um to what questions you're ask, asking. But I'll say one other thing is that, you know, in this feeling we have this scene here, which I think does add meaning and value and interpretation to what we're looking at. You know, did this one have a similar scene at the bottom? Maybe, uh, we don't know. Uh, likewise with these ones, uh, there, just, there, could be, there could be more variation than what we're looking at. Uh, we just don't really know. So um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but this is, you know, we gotta, we have to deal with what we have. Yeah, well, this is always the, the name of the game in archaeology <laughs> anyway. So, um, so, so okay, so you've just mentioned some variation, but getting back to a little bit of the consistency, you in your answer just now, you also um, brought up, again, the, the raised right hand gesture, which is one of the consistencies that you've pointed out here across this corpus. Could you talk a little bit about the wider context of this gesture and how it's distributed it, within the um the the bigger chronological and geographic yeah. arena um and how that might impact how you interpret it so for example um in relation to some of the evidence that you pointed out uh is the the stiffness of the drapery reflected in other um other examples of this gesture um, or or other distinctions between male and, fe and female figures yeah. Yeah, those are good questions. And the short answer is I'm I'm not sure, but I think there are answers to those questions. Um, I would say this, I think like, you know, if you look at Paul Myrian art, certainly you have the gesture um, of the hand raised, but not all the time. And a lot of images of women don't have it. Uh, but I think some of them do. But to be honest, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't dug into that um very much. I've actually I tried to dig into this just a little bit because as I kind of narrowed down what I was going to talk about today and realized once I and once I realized I was going to talk mostly about the stele, I did try to look into it a bit, but did not find uh, in my initial sweep a lot of research about uh, this gesture. I mean, it's, it's usually called the gesture of adoration in at least Phoenician literature. I'm not sure what it's called uh, in other areas, but it does pop up um, around the Levant, I think in the in Mesopotamia also, certainly in Syria. Um, it's, it's definitely a feature of Greco-Roman period sculpture. Uh, it's obviously a feature of Phoenician sculpture earlier, but I'm curious as to how many examples we have in the Iron Age or the Bronze Age. I have a note to look that up. I don't actually know for sure. I mean, Melissa, maybe you know. <laughs> maybe so. I'm sure someone listening maybe uh, knows, and maybe they'll give me a tip over to, to look, because I think that, I think that is uh, an important question, question and something you know, is the, like one of the next directions I want to go in is looking at the relationship of the gesture and mm -hmm. the clothing. Yeah, I mean, I, I can think of the smiting pose that's almost always in a divine context. Mm -hmm. um, but I see that Aaron has turned his video on and I think that means he wants to contribute to this part <laughs> of the conversation. So yeah, Aaron, what are your thoughts? Uh, oh, I just wanted to mention that, the you know, it's very similar kind of poses found um, on clay figurines. So obviously... Yes. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a very different um, artistic representation, um, but um, you you may find some good parallels there. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely uh, in the figurines. And what's interesting, of course, is that in the figurines, then 
is the, the, the direction of viewing is different, right? As is the case, I think, for example, with the Paul Myrin art, is that it's frontal. And here it's, it's profile. Um, what's the significance of that? I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think there, are, I, but I, I think it is, it's something to, to follow up on. Yeah, and of course, a lot of functional differences too between figurines of much different scales and these stele. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, we have a question from Becky Martin, and she's a multi-part question, so I'm going to ask it. Um, I'll, I'll ask okay. it a few at a time, or maybe one at a time here. Um, she first wants to know if you can talk more about the clothing worn by males who have the Persian caps and the swimming girl spoons. Do you think that they wear just one garment? And she's asking that because of the pleats below the belt. Wait, okay. So, I'm sorry, wrong way. Yeah, and I don't know. Related I thought to about that, this. I um, thought about, the, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've just related to that part of her question is she's also wondering if there's an Egyptian comp of random for the clothing that they wear. So it's part of that whole prompt. Of the of the male clothing. Um, I'm not sure if that is part of the same question. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Well, take the male clothing first. I thought about this. If it was wall one garment, maybe. But it seems if so. It's really complicated. I mean, there is so there there is some debate actually in the literature about if they're wearing one garment or two garments. And I decided to go. My my guess right now is two garments. Although I think it'd be an interesting experiment to see if we could try to replicate with one garment uh, what what we see there. Even though it's you know the example I have for, you know at the front is pretty it's pretty beat up. Uh, this one is possibly the one in the center. I this one to me seems more plausibly one garment with the stole. Um, but this one, I don't know. Uh, you know, then again, you know, we shouldn't expect it to be realistic, right? Getting back to one of the caveats I said at the beginning, it could very well be one garment, and they just chosen, you know, to represent it uh, the way they have it. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean it has to be realistic. So it's quite possibly they intended um, one garment. As for um, are there Egyptian precedents uh, for? I assume she means the male clothing. Maybe, but I just feel like it's a, it's a good question. The sleeve, uh, maybe, but I think stylistically it's it's quite different. Um, but I think if you try to break it down to its constituent parts, then then perhaps um, it seems like it's a lot of clothing for an Egyptian. Um, you know, they tend to prefer things that are tighter, and um, uh, and I, you know, I think typically more short sleeved, but it's a good idea to go and look at that corpus a bit more closely. Um, I think most people assume that the influence is coming from Persia. I'm not sure I agree with that, um, but uh, it is worth pursuing. Was there, was there another one about the, did she ask about the swimming girl spoon or she just was using that as a point of reference? Uh, she, I think she was using that as a point of reference. Okay, yeah. Um, right, but, yeah, so, yeah. oh, did you want to elaborate? No, I was just to say, I'm sorry, I can give better answers, but she can harass me about that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another characteristic that she wants to know more about, uh, I think in terms of the stylistic influence, perhaps, she's asking about the clean shave and whether you think that mm -hmm. is about, um, about the time period post-Alexander or if it has to do with Egyptian priests or something else. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, because something I didn't show you, uh, since this wasn't about, since it wasn't supposed to be really about male dress, but we have a, a, an example of one of these steely from Boston and Shake. It's in, it's in Beirut, um, and it's very similar to, to this type on the left, but he has a beard. Um, it's got the, you know, it's got the winged sun desk and all that, and it's got the beard. Um, it's dated by someone to, I think, the fifth or fourth century, but I'm not sure what that date's really based on. But I think that's a, it is a good, a good point. You know, did, did beards become untrendy <laughs> amongst the, uh, at least some of the Phoenician elite after Alexander, you know, the clean shaven look? Uh, it's tempting to lean that way, but we have the, then we have this problem of chronology and I've kind of like danced around it a bit. Um, 
but there's real disagreements, I think, or impreciseness in the way that stone sculpture in uh, Levantine Phoenicia is dated. It's 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 dated through kind of a com combination of style and kind of and what people think <laughs> it should be. Um, and so, you know, for example, let's see, um, you know, not this particular um, Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, statue with Egyptian kilt. This one has an inscription, so it's pretty firmly uh, dated to the Hellenistic period. But there's been other similar sculptures that come from Umal Ahmed that are, for example, in the Louvre, and they're dated to the fifth or fourth century, uh, you know, on on the plaques and and and, and whatnot. Even though there's not really any evidence that uh, Umal Ahmed, there's anything going on in Umal Ahmed in the fifth or fourth century. Not you know, there's not really any very good hard evidence, and they they do that just on the assumption that pre Hellenistic you know that something that looks egyptian must be pre-hellenistic because once you're in the hellenistic things should look greek but you know that's not the case so it's it's really um the dating is really sketchy so to get back to what i mean becky's question about beard no beard i mean should we use beard as a chronological marker i don't know maybe <laughs> um i would prefer if we had some more hard evidence but at least it is interesting though that you know, we take these the steely from Umal Ahmed, the, the inscribed ones clearly indicate a Hellenistic date. There's no reason to not think they're all Hellenistic. They are all clean shaven. Um, then perhaps, perhaps that is our chronological marker. Thank you. Again, raising more questions and answers. Um, wow. Yeah, a mark, a mark of a good talk, I would say. Um, Aaron, you have a question? Sure. Uh, sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. Um, I, I am embarrassed to, to ask, to, to move away from the dress. Um, but I'm really curious about the wing sun disc, which has nothing to do with dress, but I, I'm just wondering if you could sort of fill out, um, any of the details that you've run across, you know, regarding, um, that very distinct symbol. Um, mm. yeah. Uh, it's used from a very early time period in Phoenician arts, um, I want to say, I probably should have prepared this, I want to say the Bronze Age, but uh, I can't exactly tell you uh, what exam example proves that. Uh, we see it in, we see it in Steely, we see it on temples, um, actually. So at Umal Ahmed, we have examples um, above doorways. I mean, this one obviously doesn't have the wings, but there are examples with the wings. Um, this one is just the kind of sun disc and it's got some kind of, you know, flare at the top there and you can see the the cobras. Mm. Um, when you see them, yeah, you see them on steely, on plaques, on, um, you know, naos. I mean, it just, it's really, really common. And, you know, I would assume that it has a not dissimilar meaning as what it would in the Egyptian context. It indicates divinity, it indicates sacred space, it indicates protection from the gods, I would assume. Um, and then you, and I think, you know, we see it in Western Phoenician art also. It's definitely one of these things they pick up early on. And it's, and it's, an, it's an example of something that I imagine that when the Phoenicians, especially by the time we get to the third century, when the Phoenicians look at the symbol, I doubt they look at it and think this is Egyptian in the way we do. Um, I think, you know, it's just been part of their visual vocabulary for so long um, mm -hmm. by this time. But it is, it is interesting that it's remarkably consistent um, over time, that they're still using it. Um, including, you know, including in these Hellenistic stele. Uh, does that answer your question? Oh, yes, totally. And thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I was going to say, well, sorry, let me just add to say, like, you asked if I come across anything. People don't really talk about it that much. They say it's a winged sun disc, <laughs> or they just kind of list it as if it's, its meaning is, is uh, self evident. Mm. Um, so I don't think it's really been discussed in much in detail in, in the scholarship, um, just because people kind of take it for granted, I think. It, it just seems so so prominent in the corpus you presented um mm -hmm. and thank you for you know uh, all the background too that's super helpful uh and it does like the you know well of course i mean my my focus has always been you know earlier in time but you know to me these are relatively late examples but the kinds of continuities that they show along of course with important differences um is is remarkable and Thank you so much because I, I find this to be a remarkable corpus. Um, and I, I think like a lot of things, you know, it, it gets sort of um, divided up. And so for those of us who work in slightly earlier time periods, we're, we're blissfully unaware, you know, of this rich um, uh, set of reliefs. 
So thank you. Okay. Uh, there are some related questions to, to Aaron um, from Helen Dixon, one of our other uh, organizers of this talk series. And she is wondering if you think that the long sleeves on um, the Egyptian wig or headdress AUB example, if those are indicative in any way. And she says that we don't get to tend to get goddesses shown in long sleeves, but that may or may not be significant. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, Helen, I completely agree. So, I mean, full disclosure, I saw this one first and then I was actually thinking, is that even a woman? <laughs> Because I mean, the Louvre catalog identifies it as a goddess. I'm like, is this a woman? Because I, I just all I could see was like Nami's headdress, um, which doesn't mean anything. But that, my that was my initial reaction. And then I looked at this, uh, and I thought, oh yes, okay, I see woman. And then I saw the sleeves. I had the same thing. I was like, sleeves, big wide sleeves. Oh, that doesn't say goddess to me. That says priestess. Um, there is another example from the Louvre. Uh, sorry, I don't have it at the ready of a seated figure with wide sleeves um, without quite this headdress. Um, it's it, She has completely different hair than what we've seen so far. She Her hair is, um, her hair is shown, but it's kind of like, it's like short, it's like a bob, if you will. Um, and she's seated uh, and has the long sleeves. And it's, you know, again, it's a fragmentary stele. And that one's also interpreted as a goddess, I think because of being seated in the throne. Um, so, I mean, sleeves, you know, big, sorry, big wide sleeves or not, you know, goddess or not, I don't know. I think that's another question. You know, we have all these assumptions, um, but I think as Ignatians have shown us again and again and again through all kinds of different media, uh, we have to sometimes throw those assumptions out because they're playing, they're playing by their own rules, um, which don't necessarily agree with the, the, the rules that we we've created as, as archeologists, as we try to classify this material. But I'm definitely gonna be thinking more about sleeves and what they designate. Hmm. Thanks, yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, so uh, another question coming in from our YouTube audience asking if you have compared the styles depicted on these stele with the dress shown on terracotta votive figurines, such as the Chavez Zion assemblage. Mm. Uh, that's an easy one. No, <laughs> but um, no. So I I haven't. Uh, I've not haven't. Um, not yet. Let me put it that way. I in in terms of approaching this topic, you know, I started out because, like I said, I didn't. Um, actually, sorry. Let me, let me go back. This is be a very long answer to the question. The way I approached this topic I, was was. Rather, when I was invited to give a talk for this for this uh, series, you know, I wasn't working on women or, or or gender at all, and I thought, well, what could I possibly uh, offer? I have been working on dress a bit, but only male dress uh, in the context of my work on the Alexander sarcophagus. And so I thought, well, why not push it on to to female dress? And so I looked at a whole bunch of different images, right, possibly of women, and I thought the best way to proceed was to pick a selected corpus. Um, and so I was looking a bit at the port sarcophagi and looking at these reliefs together because, um, you know, there's, there's a material that I'm familiar with. I did have a look at the um, figurines briefly, but there's there's so many of them, right? There's so many different sites uh, that, you know, this at, at this point, I hadn't, uh, I didn't really look at them very closely because I feel like it has to be kind of, each corpus needs to be considered on its own before you start doing um, like a like comparative kind of work. But... Uh, I think that is a good idea. I think that there should be comparison. Also with Karyev, um and all the, the figurines there. I mean, we have these good assemblages, collections, and I think it's worth uh, making um, comparisons, but keeping in mind that these are very, as already stated, right? The uh, terracotta figurines have a very different function and purpose and use than the stele. So, but I think, you know, this is a, this is a dialogue that needs to happen between these, these different corpora, for sure. So I, you know, hopefully I, even better yet, a student will do that <laughs> in the future. Great, thank you. Um, we're almost at time here, so I'll ask one more question, also from Helen Dixon. And she knows that it's a really exciting identification that you've brought into play here about the alabastron and the spoon and those double delay. And it makes good sense as ingredients for a two-person ritual 
and that you you mentioned possibly marriage rituals or or double burials as possible interpretations, but could this be a depiction of couples in, in worship, meaning symbolic of a pious household, which might speak to the purpose of the stelae as votive versus other purposes, which is another issue that you've raised? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible. So we do have other depictions of two individuals. Um, so there's like this, I'm sure Helen's seen it, but there's this like, you know, four-sided chippus thing from Uma Ahmed. Uh, it's in the Beirut Museum and there's reliefs on, there's, there's figural reliefs on two sides. One has a single figure and the other side is two male figures. They face the same direction. Um, and so, you know, I do wonder if, you know, if they're, if, if they're both, but if they're both like, um, being shown as pious towards a god, I would kind of assume that they would both be facing the same direction in the direction of the divine presence um, or something. Uh, but it seems like it's a very deliberate choice here to make them face each other. And in fact, I believe, I wonder if that deliberate choice is, is also part of the reason why maybe uh, she's so much shorter than he is, uh, they didn't plan well or something in the narrow space of the stealing. Um, but I think, but I, I, but I'm like, I'm open. Like I say, like, I think we should make no assumptions and it is possible that they're just showing themselves as a divine couple, um, rather than in some sort of marriage ceremony. But I think also the, these representate these, these, uh, steely of the couples. I think they're, they're interesting and unique, um, you know, for, for this presentation of them, uh, together. And I only honestly had not thought about them very much until this presentation. Um, and I don't, it does, I can't find anywhere where people have really thought about them that much either. And I should point out that identifying these, like this is not at all my own observation. Uh, Henrika uh, Mikalau did all this work in an article from 2014 that I highly, highly recommend. But even she doesn't really go very deeply into the meaning of, you know, what the, what this uh, pairing on here means. Um, so I don't know, we're gonna have to think and talk about this more later. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Well, thank you so much again for giving us such a thought provoking presentation. Uh, so much food for thought to chew on. Um, this is a really excellent contribution to the series. So thank you, Jessica. Um, and going to just ask Brooke to uh, lead us out with um, an announcement about the next lecture in the series. All right. Well, uh, thank you again for your for your wonderful talk. Um, so to end the, the lecture today, I'd like to announce um, some of our upcoming events. So next month during March, we have three talks scheduled, the first of which will be on March 7th at 9.30 a.m. Again, California time. Uh, Dr. Agnes Garcia Ventura and Dr. Mireya Lopez Bertrand will be um, presenting on on Phoenician Punic music and musicians a gender approach. Um, so I'd like to um, invite our internet audience to to join us again next time for this talk. I'd also like to invite you all to check out our website and our social media for the Body Museum um, so that you can get information on upcoming events and, and lectures. Thank you.